So uh, as many mentioned, I am the owner of Wild Edge Woodcraft. I spend my days harvesting trees from the urban forest and transforming them into Wild Edge furniture. Uh, we also sell hardwood slabs and uh, provide vacuum drying services to other woodworkers. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I've spent the last 25 years as an overweight corporate consultant and executive. Uh, spent most of my time uh, during that time in, uh, in airports and hotels and on airplanes. Uh, so I'm very happy to say that now uh, my life has taken a dramatic change, what I think for the better. I spend most of my time outdoors now, uh, you know, in trees or around trees and working with wood and uh, getting dirty. So I, I've exchanged my, my suit <laughs> for my, and, and dress shoes for some work boots and uh, my getting dirty clothes. So that's a little bit about me. I have been doing carpentry as a hobby or as a side business for pretty much my whole life. My grandfather was a master carpenter in Tennessee and I apprenticed uh, in his shop when I was a young lad. Uh, every summer I spent most of the summers uh, following him around and trying to learn what I could from him. And that gave me the love of carpentry and woodworking. And uh, you know, now at you know, almost 50, I'm finally sort of following my life's passion, which feels good. Um, you know, every day is an adventure. It's both exhilarating and terrifying to, to be starting a small business in the middle of a pandemic, but I'm hoping for the best. Uh, I say all this just to say that um, while I have some knowledge to share, I don't consider myself an expert in the field. There are many of you who are probably in the audience today who could probably teach me a lot about this industry, um, but I'll share with you my perspective and hopefully it uh, provides you guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with uh, interesting knowledge. I'm going to cover a lot of territory today which means I'm gonna probably stay at a pretty high level. We're not gonna get down into the details of any one particular area, but I will share my contact information at the end of this, as well as being able to take questions throughout the presentation and at the end of the webinar. But if you're interested in learning any more or going into depth about any of the topics that I cover today, I would love to connect with you offline. Um, and if you're in the local area, I would also like to host you, uh, host a live tour here at the farm. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about myself or about our business. Wild Edge Woodcraft is part of Serenity Meadows Farm. Ten years ago, my lovely wife of 26 years and I started an alpaca farm here in Rougemont, North Carolina. And about half of our 25 acre farm is covered in what we would call old growth hardwood forest. So my plan when we started the farm was to harvest timber from our land and use it to build the barns and other structures here on the farm, and then also turn the hardwoods into furniture. So following that passion, um, I've done that. And uh, in the process, uh, realized that there are more trees available in the urban forest than are available in uh, my little farm. And uh, I sort of have a passion for recycling. And so I, I started going down the path of trying to understand what, uh, what it would mean to harvest trees from our urban forest. And when I use that term, just in case you're not familiar with it, uh, the urban forest, different than the rural forest, is you know trees that are growing in our neighborhoods, cities and neighborhoods, and, you know in the in the front yards and backyards of people's homes. So that's a little bit about the business. We I have three sons, and we moved out here with the idea of teaching our boys self reliance and independence and the skills of everything from raising your own food, raising animals and doing carpentry, plumbing, electrical, things of that nature. Um, so that's that's the, the family business in a nutshell. So we'll just 
so everybody's sort of familiar with the wood industry as an industrial ecosystem, right? Large scale logging operations, highly mechanized, heavy equipment. We all have seen the log trucks driving around. Um, a lot of the wood that comes out of our, you know, this kind of harvest process, the logging industry is actually shipped overseas and is processed in big factories, in uh, highly automated factories, and then comes back to us in the forms of goods and services available in our retail stores. And that's not the industry that I consider myself participating in. Um, I consider myself part of the urban wood value stream. Uh, and I like to talk about that as, as being able to take, uh, complete the whole process from tree to table. And you probably always, you, you've heard this term farm to table. Well, I, I think about it as tree to table. So it all starts in the urban forest, you know, the, the neighborhoods and cities. And the harvesting of trees from the urban forest is very different than harvesting trees, obviously, from rural forest. And so I'm going to talk about that, what's different and what it takes to do that. Um, transport is different. Uh, then the sawmill application is different. Um, uh, the process of then turning in milled, uh, the milled raw material into a finished product uh, through the air dry, vacuum dry, you know, the crafting process, and ultimately it, putting something in the hands of the customer. So I'm going to cover each step in this process, how uh, the equipment you need and how I perform the functions within this step. This is not to say this is the only way, the right way. It's not even to say that you can't participate in, in different parts of the value stream. In fact, I think most people find a niche and a, and a specialty and play their role in and live in one or more of these parts. Um, but very, very rarely do, is it done probably all under one roof. But because it is a cottage industry, and that's, that's how I'm set up, is to actually do this from tree to table. That's what I'm gonna share with you today. So we'll start with the infrastructure, the facilities, equipment, and tools that are necessary to do, uh, to complete this value stream all under one roof. And I'll start it about four years ago when I bought this uh, timber harvester bandsaw mill from a Mennonite farmer in Ithaca, New York. So that was quite the adventure. I had actually never driven a skid steer in my life, and I bought the skid steer from the same gentleman, uh, and it came on the back of the same truck. So we drove it off, and then we used it to unload the skid steer. And, uh, and, and then from that point on, it has been an adventure and a learning curve, a steep learning curve every day since. Uh, the other, you know, once you have a sawmill and mine's electric, it's not portable. So it, I needed a place to put it, so I had to build a lean-to next to our shop. And once you have a sawmill, uh, you realize pretty quickly that you're producing a lot, of, a lot of boards that need to be dried before they can be used and worked into furniture. So I uh, decided to invest in a kiln. And I started by building a solar kiln because I was you know, trying to do this on a budget and be very cost effective. Uh, learned pretty quick that a solar kiln wouldn't keep up with the uh, capacity that I wanted to use um, or that I needed to run a business. And so I decided to invest in what's called an iDry vacuum kiln. And spoiler alert, that's the iDry being delivered uh, and uh, it's a 15,000 pound piece of equipment that we had to rent a crane and then we pulled it off the truck and um, then put it on the back of my trailer and drove it you know, from the local church parking lot to my house and unloaded it again, moved the crane and unloaded it uh, the second time. So I'm trying, there we go. So this is a picture of the crane putting it in place and then we built the, the cover, the building, if you will, around the kiln. I couldn't figure out a way to get a 15,000 pound piece of equipment in a building. So we decided to set it on a concrete pad and build the building around it. If I ever get a second one, I don't know how I'm gonna put it in the building. 
the other pieces of equipment that you need because you're dealing with pretty heavy, uh, you know, pretty heavy raw materials here uh, are skid steer or tractor. Um, I happen to have one of each, which works well for me um, because I can take one to a job site and use it to load my trailer, bring the, the, the trunk home and use the other one to unload. But you know, certainly, I know a lot of people who um, who don't have two, and so. But you do need you do need something to be able to pick up some pretty heavy logs. Um, you can see the dump trailer and um, this uh, little Yale walk behind uh, that I bought uh, from from a Walmart auction is very handy for moving heavy stuff around in the shop and in the storage barns. The other facility or piece of equipment you need is just a workshop space. So I uh, happen to have this building uh, on the property when we moved in. And so I claimed it as my shop. And I remember telling my wife at the time, because it was the largest shop I had ever had, that I said, I'll never need a bigger shop. And uh, fate laughed because uh, many, many times since then I have complained that I am out of room and I need more space. Uh, the other sort of hand tools that are necessary, you know, if you're going to harvest trees from the urban forest, you need uh, you need a chainsaw, you need uh, woodworking equipment like joiners and planers and band, uh, belt sanders, and you need a really good moisture meter uh, because moisture is the probably the number one thing we have to deal with when processing wood from tree to table is you know how do we deal with the moisture in the wood uh, getting it dry enough to work and then keeping it dry through the finished process so that's basically the infrastructure uh, required uh, with one last thing you need space to store all of these logs um, until they can be processed and then you need space to store the the milled lumber until it can be turned into product Avery we do have one question from Tom Dwyer he'd like to know isn't it important to keep logs up off the ground to prevent mold staining uh, yes, it is. And so you'll see some of these stacks are temporary, um, but most of them we've got uh, we've got bunks. So some of the pine logs, some of the smaller pine logs we put down and we stack the other logs on top of them. Uh, but yes, it is ideal to get them up off the ground uh, so that they're not absor absorbing moisture. It's really ideal to process the logs quickly uh, within a couple of weeks or months of taking them down. Uh, unfortunately, you know, being a, a, a one person operation, I am way behind in processing my logs and milling them. Um, I do get help from friends uh, uh, from time to time, but for the most part, it's just me. And so what you see is the accumulation of about a year's worth of harvest, um, but not very much milling. Um, I'm, I've been keeping up with custom milling orders, but I haven't been milling for myself. I'm hoping that things have slowed, the tree service uh, part of the business will slow down during the winter and will give me a chance to catch up on some of this uh, saw milling. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the urban forest and, and harvesting in the urban forest. Uh, so I mentioned to you that that we have some uh, about 15 acres of hardwoods here on our farm and I do harvest uh, selectively. I had the North Carolina Forestry Service uh, come out and walk the property with me on three different occasions and we developed or they developed a a forestry management plan that I follow for um, the health of the forest and sustainable harvest. And uh, I'm learning a lot through that process uh, under the expert guidance of foresters from the North Carolina Forestry Service. I highly recommend anybody who's managing Timberland to go through that process. It's very inexpensive and it's extremely, you know, it's extremely valuable. Um, the, the amount of knowledge these guys have is tremendous and it's, it's I, I feel uh, to be a responsible landowner that that's an important part of 
you know, what I do in the, you know, urban wood ecosystem. Uh, that being said, I am harvesting mostly from urban neighborhoods now. Um, so this was sort of by accident. I never planned to get into the tree service business, but I had so many people calling and asking me to please come and take down their trees and uh, to do it safely and economically. And since there's a value proposition for me, I'm able to do that at you know a little bit of a discount compared to um, what another tree service who might not be using that wood or might actually be paying to somebody to haul away that wood. Um, but obviously that's a niche too, because if the wood isn't of sufficient value or quality, or if the tree is already dead, it's not something that I can use. Um, but that being said, um, I, we, we began to do this process of, of, you know, we're calling it the tree service part of that value stream. And, um, in the process, we have been able to collect, as you saw from my log yard, quite a few trees um, at a very low cost of acquisition. Uh, I think this is an important, this is actually a critical part of the urban ecosystem because homeowners don't have a lot of options. You know, frankly, unless the tree service um, has a sawmill in their, as part of their equipment and their business model, they're, they're in a position of really needing to haul, the, haul away the waste, what, what becomes a waste product, and either pay to, to dump it somewhere, like one of the, the county landfills, or they're taking it back to their property and dumping it, and uh, it's just rotting in the woods or it's being burned. Um, so, uh, and, and mainly because the industrial logging environment doesn't have a good way to process these logs. They don't want these logs because they're either too big, too short, they're not delivered in a way that they can easily be unloaded and put into their equipment, or because they have metal in them. And so um, it's sort of really important that tree services and sawmills get together and work collaboratively to, to strengthen this value stream, to make these connections so that the, the sawmills are able, you know, the, the portable sawmills and the small sawmills uh, like mine are able to get our hands on, on the wood in, you know, as cheaply as possible. Anyway, so, so we go out and get it, and, and sometimes we're lucky enough to actually be paid to take the wood down. Uh, transport is probably my biggest challenge, and so um, the equipment required to transport can be significant. Uh, here's a short little video of um, a tree service. This is Chip from Chipmunks Tree Service in uh, Henderson, and he's taking down some very large oak trees at the Masonic Home for Children in Oxford. And I'm working with the home to turn some of their trees into memory wood tables. I'm doing this as part of a charity to help them raise money for the home. And uh, Chip very kindly agreed to you know, spend a little extra time after taking the tree down, um, using his equipment, his crane to to load the tree onto my trailer. The reason this is important is that that piece of wood that you see there in the video weighs over 10,000 pounds, much bigger, uh, much too heavy for even my large skid steer to pick up. And so I have to load it on the trailer and then take it directly to not my sawmill, but another sawmill. Um, it's actually Murdoch's sawmill in Bonn, uh, he's got a very large sawmill that can cut a six foot wide oak uh, or a six foot wide trunk. And so I take the really big stuff over to Jack and he mills it for me and then I go get it and come back. If it's not that, if it's not that big and I can pick it up with my tractor or skid steer, I'll load it in the back of my jump trailer or on the back of our flatbed trailer and bring it back to the sawmill. That's sort of the idea, ideal situation. In a few cases, I actually have tree services such as Chris Johnson's uh, Johnson Tree Experts and uh, Scott Benjamin, the local tree services that will bring the logs to me rather than take them to a landfill. And um, 
that's that's a service to the client. It's also a service to society and our economy, or not our economy, but the ecology, right? Um, because that that way, you know, something valuable comes from this wood product instead of it going to waste. Um, I'll just show you a quick video. This was one that Mindy took of the sawmill in operation. Uh, here we're cutting uh, a walnut log. This was a yard tree and it did have metal, but we were able to find it and pull it out. Uh, speaking of metal, I do, one of the pieces of equipment that is you know, vital for this kind of processing is a good metal detector. And so we, we I, I got to the point where it's just habit now, you've got to check the log and you try to dig it out. If it's a high value log like maple or walnut, um, or a good size oak, it's probably worth the time to dig out the metal or cut around it. Uh, if it's a pine log, I'm less inclined to do that just because I I can spend hours digging, uh, you know, digging a few nails out of a log. And again, the, the you sort of have to balance the is the end product worth, you know, is, is the juice worth worth the squeeze. Uh, a couple of techniques in uh, in sawing, and I realize we're sort of running short on time, so I'm gonna go quick. Um, this little video, I'm just sort of describing that when you have a check in a log, and a check is a crack that happens when it's drying, you know, the ends dry faster than the core. Uh, you wanna try to orient the log on the mill such that you're capturing as much of that crack, or at least the biggest crack in a single slab so that you're not, uh, you know, if, if I had turned this log 90 degrees, uh, every log that came off this uh, particular, or every board that came off this log would have that crack in it running right down the middle of the board. So, um, you know, that's, that's sort of important is to read the log, understand, you know, the bow, the twist, where the tension in the log is going to be, you know, if the log was a heavy leaner when it was growing, then it's gonna have a lot more tension on one side of the log than the other. And when you go to cut it, you need to take that into account because it's either going to bow or it's going to uh, bend. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about vacuum kiln technology versus say solar kiln or traditional um, dehumidification kilns or what it's known as heat kilns. They're all good. Um, it's really about speed and a little bit about quality and simplicity. So um, all the kilns that I know of are, it's better if you air dry before you put them in a kiln. And a kiln is really just meant to finish the process of drying and also to sanitize the wood. Uh, it's important to sanitize the wood because there are little creatures that, that lay their eggs in wood and you don't want a caterpillar or a bug crawling out of your dining room table or out of your kitchen hutch or whatever. So before you go working wood, uh, you want it to be completely dry and sterilized. And so that's where the value of a kiln comes in. Um, vacuum kiln technology is the fastest and safest way to dry wood that I know about. And the reason for that, it's also the, one of the most economic, uh, not just because of the speed, but the energy requirements are pretty low because uh, if you've ever tried to like make coffee or boil water up in the mountains, uh, you know that water boils at a lower temperature in, in thinner atmosphere, right? And so in a vacuum, it boils pretty quickly or it evaporates, turns into a gas very quickly. So what a vacuum kiln does is it sort of simulates um, the ideal environment for drying wood, which would be at altitude, but also warm, which would be like on Mars. So if we could like simulate drying our wood on Mars, then that's what a vacuum kiln does. At least that's my layperson description. But, uh, there's a smaller one called a standard, and then there's a bigger one called a turbo, and the turbo is really cool because it also has uh, a rubber bladder that lets a little bit of the atmosphere, uses the pressure of the atmosphere to push down on the top of the, the, the stack of wood and press it flat so that it's less likely to work. Um, 
and yes, it is important to have weight or um, straps or some something to sort of prevent the wood from warping and twisting and moving too much during the drying process. Uh, you're not going to be able to prevent it entirely, and you know there's some debate as to whether or not doing so actually you know, creates a problem down the road where that tension is eventually going to come out. It's just going to come out more slowly. Um, I don't know. I haven't been doing it long enough to know for sure. But um, so far, the results I've been getting from the wood I've been drying has been, you know, satisfactory. In fact, I've been thrilled with the results I've been getting. Um, they come out uh, with good color. They come out, uh, you know, mostly with no damage or minimized damage, uh, pretty flat. And then, you know, I can work them into uh, furniture and have done so um, with quite a bit of what's come out of my kiln. Uh, so that being said, uh, one of the challenging parts is loading the kiln. Um, I'm still I'm still working on a better way to do this, but uh, this is a picture or video of me and my son, uh, one of my sons sort of pushing this uh, beast into the kiln. Uh, it's easier to load than it is to unload because it, there's a slight slope towards the back. Um, that way, when water sort of evaporates off the wood, it can collect and drain. You want, you want to fill it up you, because it's, uh, it uses air. Uh, you'll see the fan in the lower right with the, uh, the heating elements. It blows air around the kiln. And so if you have big voids in the kiln, um, the air is going to follow the path of least resistance and it's not going to, you know, the, the low pressure is going to go, go to the low pressure and the high pressure, it's not, it's not going to go through the wood. So you'll see I've used, I use this pink styrofoam to baffle the wood, uh, to baffle the air, but uh, that's sort of important. But ideally you want to fill it up as much as you can. I will point out that kiln board feet is a little different than just traditional board feet in that, um, you know, wacky shaped pieces, live edge pieces, bowls, they all take up more space in the kiln than, than just the technical volume of wood like you would see in an industrial setting. And so um, I do I did sort of coin this term kiln board feet to help my customers understand that when they're leasing space in my kiln, they're leasing the footprint that their wood requires, um, not exactly the board foot measurement of their wood. And so that's sort of an important concept to understand. And then I mentioned drying. So a good moisture meter is important. Uh, this one dries, has specific, I mean, 42 different species. And it also has adjustment for temperature. So if I'm checking the wood and it's fresh out of the kiln at 140 degrees, I need my, mortar, my moisture meter to know that so that I get an accurate reading versus if I'm, I'm checking it at room temperature, you know, outdoor temperature, 70 degrees. Uh, that being said, I will just quickly say that the other fun part about my job is working with wood and turning it into furniture. I'm not gonna play all these extra videos because we're out of time, but um, this, I just wanna show sort of a couple of, of pieces, finished pieces. And here we go. So this is the kitchen island that I actually made for my wife. Um, and it's one of the few like show pieces I have. Almost everything I make gets sold. Um, but this one is a show piece available. Uh, you know, if somebody wants to see what a live edge kitchen island looks like. This is a uh, spalted quarter sawn sycamore. And then, uh, you know, here's, here's some white oak that we use to make a step in the store and uh, a live edge piece of sycamore for a client. This, this was an interesting project because the, the slab warped pretty significantly during the drying process. And so we had to create relief cuts on the bottom and wedge and use epoxy to fill. But we were able to straighten that sucker back out um, and it created you know, an absolutely beautiful table. And the client was very happy. Uh, the other the, the other great part about my job is the customers I get to meet. So I'll just say real quick, I never sort of when I set out to do the woodworking, I was you know in love with the woodworking and the idea of working outside. I didn't realize how much of my time would be spent in in marketing and sort of business administration. 
but um, the best part of that about that is the customers. So uh, I had a customer actually uh, give me a pecan pie, homemade pecan pie, which made me very happy. Um, and then this lovely family, uh, this gentleman brought his whole family out to, to pick the wood that they wanted to use for their for their new kitchen table for their home. And so it was sort of a, a whole family affair. And the kids came out and they saw the alpacas and they had a good time. And I just love meeting the customers and, and interacting with people over social media. So with that said, I realized that I'm four minutes over our allotted time. I'll just give you my contact information and I'm happy to stay on and take questions for as long as people are willing to, to hang out. Uh, and as long as, as Mindy is uh, willing to keep the WebEx open. But with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up and see if there are any uh, last minute questions.